Welcome to the podcast for Healing Neurology, where we talk about everything that can help heal your neurology, which is really everything from food, lifestyle, and medicine to nature, culture, and politics. There's no topic too big or too small. I'm Jillian Ehrlich, family nurse practitioner certified in Ayurveda and functional medicine. And we are thrilled today to have Chef Aaron Stark, who is the director of food service at Jefferson Healthcare. And he is leading the charge to bring healthy, fresh, local food to all. His path in culinary arts started at the age of 18 as an American Culinary Federation apprentice in Atlanta, Georgia, and led him across the country, gaining a diversity of culinary influences. He trained under two certified master chefs before serving as executive chef at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and executive sous chef at Hotel Wheatley in Western Massachusetts. His pursuit for formal training led him west, where he acquired a degree in culinary arts at Le Cordon Bleu in Portland, Oregon. And upon completion, he earned the Oregonian's 2005 Restaurant of the Year as executive chef of Andina, a novo Peruvian restaurant. Today, Chef Aaron enjoys making healthy gourmet meals accessible to everyone in his community. And as you'll learn as we talk about, that is not an understatement. He frequently teaches cooking classes at the farmer's market schools, the food bank, and the hospital. And under his leadership, the hospital cafe has become a favorite of local staff and patients. Chef Aaron lives in Port Townsend, Washington, where he enjoys home-scale farming with his family and adventuring on the water by paddleboard, which you were just out on this morning. How was it out there? Oh, it was absolutely beautiful. Light breeze, beautiful water. It's just the perfect thing to do to wake up in the morning. Well, welcome. Welcome to our show. We're so happy to have you. you. Thank you very much. (laughs) So I have wanted to interview you literally for like two years, like definitely at least a year and a half before I ever started this podcast. Because I think what you're doing is both remarkable and incredibly unique. Can you tell us what are you doing as Director of Food Service at Jefferson Healthcare, which is the main hospital in Jefferson County? Well, food is being a pillar of a healthy lifestyle. A uh, healthy existence, kind of. I put a lot into that, and the idea that we living here in in Jefferson County, we have all the resources. We have fish, we have mushrooms, we have organic produce, we have uh, shellfish, beef, chicken. You shake a stick at it, we have it. So we've got the cornucopia of goods. And the idea over the past umpteen years, I've made all these relationships with local farmers, and quite honestly, it was to support farmers. And I know that the best quality food is coming from a local farmer that are their growing product based on their flavor profile. So if you want the best food, you buy it locally. And then I think about the idea of, of a hospital. You know, when you talk about food at a hospital in general, everybody kind of makes this funny face. But if we can make food a pleasure point of a hospital stay, something that actually people kind of look forward to, And I think there's a lot of generationally, you know, the baby booners, they kind of expect that, you know, to be catered to. And that's my background is is hospitality. So bringing hospitality to a hospital, I guess. I've got the best crew in town as far as cooks are concerned. That's because I've been here for so long and made all these relationships. So we have the best product and the best cooks that can manipulate that, best culinarians manipulating the product. So kind of out to be the best hospital food in the nation. And we're critical access hospital, we're only 24 rooms. So it's kind of a fun thing to do. So do you know how um, many hospital meals you serve per year? Yeah, about uh, average census on a daily is 16 in-house patients. But we see a lot of outpatients going through. Of course, with COVID-19, our cafe is closed to the general public. So we're feeding staff and patients. But prior to COVID, we were feeding people just come to the hospital and eat. So as far as patient meals, we're feeding on average uh, 16 patients, three square meals a day throughout the year. And then to the public, when we were in full fledged, I mean, generally based it on sales numbers, which, you know, we're feeding well over 300 people lunch every day, um, which is pretty remarkable thing. It's all the, you know, we're putting the best effort we can into the food. And certain times of the season, you know, 90% of our produce is coming locally uh, from local farmers. July, August, September, when we have our best season for food, uh, we're buying so much from local vendors. We started a program probably eight years ago where we we purchased vouchers from farmers early in the season. In the January, February, March, when farmers don't really have a lot coming off the farm, we're purchasing vouchers that we then use to purchase produce throughout the year. So 
It's the concept of seed money, or here's some cash flow in your slow time that we'll use later on in the year. And that forces our hand to kind of purchase locally. So we have uh, four farmer partners that we're working with uh, currently that we've done ventures with. So how did this all get started? You know, I have a passion for food. And to go back and say, when I was in my heyday of being a chef, being a culinarian in the restaurant world, the last thing you ever would aspire to be is a hospital chef. The absolute last thing to aspire uh-huh. to be a hospital <laughs> chef. But I live in this small town that's got a seasonal, you know, tourist trade. Uh, most of the restaurateurs that I know in town, they they kind of they have, you know, they struggle. And I wanted something that, that was a little bit more secure in the job line. But I feel like I have a lot to offer to the hospital setting. I got rid of the ego of being this big chef and I'm okay with being a hospital chef. And I'm just turning my attentions to how we can turn that into something really beautiful. And it's challenging. It's a, you're making a meal that goes onto a tray and sits for sometimes 20, 30 minutes before it gets served to a patient. And that's challenging. It's a dietary needs and, and um, kind of getting a glimpse of what your clientele is and what eating and comfort food goes a long way at a hospital. But just the idea of supporting local farmers and being the chef at a hospital and mm-hmm. saying, well, I can buy produce. I mean, I can feed your produce to local, you know, to patients. And the beautiful thing is that I get to feed a whole spectrum of my community. Everybody, no matter who you are, I get to, you know, if you come through the hospital, I get to feed you. I've got a very captive audience. <laughs> One of the former board members of the hospital board once told me that there are three variables to a hospital stay. One is that you get out alive. The next is that people are nice to you. And the last is that the food's decent. And so that makes the perfect hospital stay. Well, of course, uh, we want to get you out alive. We want to be nice to you. And if the food's exceptional, then it's just, it makes it a, a really pleasant experience. And I just feel like my desire to teach people what I know, which is kind of in the culinary world, some people kind of hold their cards tight. Uh, They don't really share a lot with me. I've just been all through my career. People have shared ideas, shared techniques, methods, uh, recipes, and I just forward that on. And it's not so much about gourmet cooking as about cooking for a healthy lifestyle. Um, So the whole idea of a patient coming to stay at our hospital, if it somehow can be a learning experience, if a menu can teach somebody something, if we can help direct a patient onto the right path about how they should be eating in their life to to enhance their lifestyle, then then we've done our job. And you're talking a lot about taste in terms of the the food tastes good. But of course, really what we know about health, health feels good. And so ways that you make food taste good are starting out with quality ingredients, which means in your ingredients, and I hear you saying are local, organic, essentially grown in season, in place. Mm -hmm. They're not traveling long distances. They're not being irradiated. And then the other thing is cooking interesting recipes that are uh, and healthy ingredients. So you're not using a lot of cornstarches and all those other fillers. So I've got a really talented staff and that goes a long way. We like to play in the kitchen. I feel like our kitchen in the hospital setting is somewhat of an oasis. It takes people away from that sterile hospital feeling. Generally have music playing. It's not unheard of to have someone serenade you or dancing in the kitchen. But I set parameters when we write the menu for the cafe, not the patients, but the cafe where we feed. Right now we're just feeding staff. But I leave it up to the cooks to kind of help generate the weekly menu. So we kind of focus on a protein. Okay, we've got lean cod. What are we going to do with it? Oh, let's crust it with quinoa and serve it with, you know, braised greens and rice. Okay, well, let's do that. So we'll put that on the menu. And so that expression point of a cook, as a culinarian, they know all the, they know the methods, they know how we do things. And, you know, as a young cook, when people said, you have to cook it exactly this way and make it taste just like this, it was kind of boring where they said, well, kind of do what you want to do, but, you know, kind of let me taste it when you're finished. All sorts of conversations about food in the kitchen and where we could take things. And that's a big part of it is like reimagining the whole hospital feeding process and trusting people and their skills and their craft that they can be proud of. And I think that goes a long way. Let's take a couple of your recipes. I'm just, I pulled up, um, you know, the cafe menu from this week. 
just looking at a couple of the recipes, last night's dinner was artichoke, parmesan, rockfish served with couscous and vegetables. So can you walk us through kind of like, where did those foods come from? The rockfish is coming from, if I'm not mistaken, it's coming from Canada. It's a rockfish from Canada. And we're portioning the rockfish out. It's a frozen product. And we are making a remoulade, which is a variation of mayonnaise, to top the fish. And then you can crust on top. A lot of people use panko breadcrumbing, but we like gluten-free. So oftentimes we'll use cooked quinoa. So when that crisps up in the oven, it gives a nice texture to a fish. So the artichokes are there. Of course, they're artichoke hearts that were kind of more of a can thing and using that in that topping with the Parmesan. And actually a dish was put together through one of my, my lead cook, Chanda Johnson, mm-hmm. uh, off of that. So it's been kind of fun. Well, we have rockfish. What are we going to do with it, Chanda? It leads to all sorts of fun conversations. And we've taken that to so many extremes. We do it with salmon as a beautiful mm-hmm. presentation with salmon. Couscous we had, and then I think we served that with, with braised chard, if I'm not mistaken. So that was local chard from Red Dog Farm that we pick the chard, wash it, uh, chop it, serve it up with some aromatic vegetables, a little bit of acid, vinegar, lemon juice. So we're actively tasting things before we just put it out onto the line, using our senses to cook. (laughs) What a great experience in terms of for the people who are, you know, if we want things to be nourishing and healing, we want them to be healing all along the line. So for the folks at Red Dog who are growing the chard, growing the chard to the people picking, to Mm -hmm. the cooks cooking, to the eaters eating. It's got that whole, we always get rainbow chard. So it's got all those different nutrients from the different colors of the stems. Eat a rainbow. And with the artichokes being canned, so it is a mix. Like you do do some things you're not necessarily beholden to. You know, the idea that we're all organic, all local is um, kind of under budgetary restraints. We can't necessarily go organic. Although the idea has been is there. And I think there is. I think that there are hospitals in this country that are certified organic patient menu. Everything they're serving their patient is certified organic, but they built that into their budget beforehand. They've kind of speculated on that. We do it from the sense of like, what can we get in from the local farmers that's organic? Mm -hmm. Our fish comes from a local fishery. Our salmon comes from a local fishery. Our beef, generally, and you think about a hospital What kind of beef are we using in a hospital setting? Well, on the patient menu, we have uh, what we call a terrace major cut, which is a a primal cut, a bistro filet. We use some flat iron there, but for the main, we're using stew meat and ground beef. And we have a Shorts family farm uh, supply us with all of our stew meat and all of our ground beef. And that's local in Chimicum. That's less than 20 miles away from the hospital. We get a lion's share of our beef. So it's, it's kind of fun that way. One of your other lunches, like on Friday, it's going to be chicken enchiladas served with citrus slaw ice. Tell us about that dish. And right, what is citrus slaw? That's uh, there. There we go. Another one. Uh, so chicken enchiladas. We're just making a base of chicken breasts that we're getting. They're certainly not local. We don't have a chicken producer that can do local chicken for our cafe. We do have a local chicken spring rain farm that we have on our patient menu. Local organic. So essentially, you're making chicken enchiladas, beautiful, nice, home feeling. But then we have this idea of salad. We're getting into the salad season, lots of salad with lunch. But I've always felt really strong about cabbage. We, the Dungeness River Valley over in Squim, is the number one place in the United States to propagate cabbage seed. It says uh, Nash Huber, Nash is organic produce. He's a good pal of ours over in Squim. So we have this overabundance of cabbage from my Southern upbringing. I know how to make a slaw. And we all think about coleslaw just being this lacy ribbons of cabbage and carrots with some mayonnaise sour cream base, but it doesn't have to be. It can be with aromatic vegetables and vinegar base. So it's a really healthy vitamin C happening and and, uh, uh, fresh. I kind of feel lots of fiber there. We have this beautiful feel for slaws, these cabbage salads. And it's um, almost like a quick pickle. You salt the cabbage, you know, uh, mix it up for a little bit, and then add, add vinegars, different vinegars, different profiles, different spices, different vegetables and herbs to it. And you come up with something different. 
but that citrus slaw is a vague term because we're having fun with it. We do, we have a herb garden on hospital grounds that has probably about 15 different varieties of herbs in it, including basil and parsley and cilantro and tarragon and fennel and all sorts of beautiful herbs for us to go at. So it makes it kind of fun. So is it food services, the department that cares for the garden? We actually have a, a groundskeeper, but out of some of my budget of the hospital is growing herbs for the kitchen. It comes out oh, of my wow. food cost. That's yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> if we were to look at your budget, and I don't know how much you feel comfortable speaking to this, but like, can you kind of pie chart out what percentage of your budget goes for kind of like local meats or local vegetables versus? Yeah, I'd kind of, I would say we're getting, well, Alaskan salmon from a local fisherman. We're mm-hmm. getting local beef. We're getting to some degree for patient menu, local chicken, local vegetables. Right now we are getting uh, local vegetables in. We're still yeah. relying on the produce company for things that aren't quite in season yet. Of course, we get into the doldrums of the kale doldrums and kind of like the fall and winter is like staff is like, Oh, kale's getting, you know, you're serving us kale again. But then that challenges the cooks that I work with is like, well, how can we bring kale to a different light for the cafe? It goes from everything to lemon Parmesan kale to cream kale to kale and apples, you know, citrus kale. So we're having fun doing all these variations and, but we still get the roll of eyes, oh, kale again, or you eat it. And that's a big thing too, is like just turning people onto the whole idea that food is a fuel as well, all a pleasure point. It's interesting. And, uh, you know, but I distinctly remember the first time we served parsnips, roast, oven roasted parsnips through the cafe line at Jefferson Healthcare. Uh, we had these beautiful golden nuggets of parsnips and people would come and say, what's that? And you kind of say, well, sir, that's a parsnip. Oh, I hate parsnips. Say, well, why do you hate parsnips? Oh, my granny used to boil them and make me eat them. And then you'd throw down the gauntlet and say, I'd I'd double dog dairy to take a no thank you bite. And then they give them one and then they eat a beautiful caramelized oven roasted parsnip and you see their face light up. And instant gratification on a culinary, you see their facial expression just like, Uh, oh, yeah. And they say, you know, I think I will take some of those. (laughs) And it's this beautiful, I I just turned some 68-year-old guy on the parsnips, you know. That even goes to say that when we do the cooking classes, and we do cooking classes over at the farmer's market, the food bank, you name it. But this whole idea, I've got folks that are in the mindset that uh, cooking is not my job. And when they come to a cooking class, I relate it to the same thing. It's the same mechanism as building a birdhouse, more or less. It's a process. You have the materials and you're building something. It's just more of a sensual experience. You're using all your senses. You're using your taste and your smell and your touch and your ears. So with that, it's been really remarkable because we have a lot of retirees in this community and they're looking for something to do. They come to a cooking class, and then all of a sudden, they're repeat. They're coming to the class. They're learning about methods cooking, which I teach methods cooking. I'm not, this is the recipe. I'm like, the recipe, you can do anything you want. You can author your own recipe. I'm going to show you the methods of how to cook stuff. And with that, I find these, certainly, there's, I have got a, a fan club of older gentlemen that I've turned on to cooking. And a lot of those guys are gearheads. So the next week, Aaron, I bought a new knife. And then, uh, oh, we just bought a new six burner Viking stove or something like that. It's pretty fun. So they get turned on to food. And then I've, so I've got this whole group of foodies in town. Uh, poor Townsend and Jefferson County in general, we're, we're a, a, a big town of foodies. It is. It is really fun. I mean, that's one of the things that I loved. I lived there for about eight years. Still, as you know, have a crew that I adore. Sure. And so sure. that is the thing is it's always a good place to eat. Yeah, Lots of good it's recipes. a lot of fun. I remember when you and I were first talking about doing this interview and we were talking about the origins of feeding people this kind of food, you were saying, and I was asking, well, how did this even come about? And you were saying, well, it started out with me just sitting around the campfire with my farming buddies. Some of the poorest people I know in my life are farmers. And any way that I can support a farmer, I'm going to try my damnedest to to support them. But it's that whole idea of it's all about relationships. I mean, Mm -hmm. inner city hospitals and it would have everything to do with the executive chef having personal relationships with farmers. 
to make all that happen. I think that's what made it so easy. Moving to Port Townsend, I already had a fine group of farmer friends just based on what my wife does. We kind of think outside of the box. Cody really pull this off. I'm like, yes, we can pull this off. I can take the stuff you grow and feed it to patients at the hospital. That's, wow. that's an easy. In fact, it's beneficial in every way. So it's all a pro thing. And especially because with the way Medicare, so in an older community, the way Medicare reimburses, if a patient comes into a hospital um, within 30 days, then often the second hospital stay isn't covered. So if you can actually give people better fuel and better nourishment, then there's there may be a better chance of them you know, healing better. It's a whole lifestyle thing. Really, you know, I think there's a few things missing. And I think it has to do is generationally, we've gotten away from parents teaching kids how to cook, grandparents teaching kids how to cook. Certainly the idea of a fast food. I mean, I don't want to have to work for it. I want it just instant gratification. I want to eat now without having putting anything into it. But there's nothing as beautiful as I call them full circles, where you catch a fish and you eat it. You grow salad greens and you make a salad out of them. That is one of those, it's something that's just more than, oh, let's go pick up a box of lettuce greens at the Safeway and go with it. You know, it's yeah. it's something more enriching. And people, you know, wax terroir of the lettuce and, and all that. But mm-hmm. I'm a huge proponent of organic only because organic farmers, when they pick their seed, they're basing that on flavor profile. Most commodity crops, they're basing it on, we want big. Prime example is fennel commodity fennel, they want big bulbs of fennel that are sweet. Uh, Whereas the organic farmer will go more for not such a size, but they want the anise flavor. They want that that flavor. So plant breeders, they breed for stuff like that. And that's why it's so fun to go to a farmer's market with your Martha Stewart basket and try stuff and buy stuff. Can't do that now, but we begin to miss the old ways. (laughs) I think we should put more effort into our food, more time into our food and more of our income into our, our food. I believe that. Do you have thoughts, and I'm not sure how sticky a subject this is also, but like what would it take, you know, agribusiness, so what we're talking about is like big agribusiness, big Mm -hmm. agriculture, big, you know, single commodities that are, you know, span acres and acres of corn and acres and acres of soybeans. What would it take to kind of subvert that? What would it take? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with, with labor. In the old days, our country was kind of supported on migrant labor. Much of my upbringing dealing with migrant farmer workers delivering produce, and that's gotten away from us, and the farmers feel the effect of that. So what does a farmer do? They don't have the hands to harvest multiple crops off of their land, so they go, well, I'm going to stick to these things. You know, here locally, we've got a produce farmer that went to grains and carrots, and that's pretty much all he does um, because that it's all mechanized the reliability of staff to do that. And it's really hard to find someone that's willing to go work out in the elements for minimum wage. So that's had a lot to do with it. I have a dream that every community should have a community kitchen and that in that community kitchen, that there is an opportunity for not only for people to learn how to cook, but the resources, think of all the cookbooks that I've given away, it could have a culinary library but also that whole idea of community cooking, actually getting people together and making large amounts of food and then they take it home and they've got food that they can later eat. Just a place that, that is a kitchen. The only factor is manipulating food. And years ago, I built a kitchen like that here in town, my workshop, and it was fun. And I saw the light. I like, we can teach classes here. I can cater out of it. It's just a workshop of a kitchen. And To this day, people are still using that kitchen uh, to manipulate food for cottage industry for themselves. It's pretty neat stuff. That would be such an interesting business model. Think about it like this. What if there was a nonprofit food service management company? The labor pool was actually people learning to cook, but it also acts as like anything that a farmer has left over, they're automatically bringing it to this kitchen. And knowing full well that they'll get a commodity price for that product, and that food then gets manipulated. And then, dare I say, like, since you're a food service management company, then all the retirement homes that require a food service for their patients, uh, the hospital, it could be schools, could contract with this this nonprofit food service management company 
And it'd be kind of cool because everybody would kind of be eating the same thing in town. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do this, And it would just happen. But I have lofty dreams about that. But I feel like the beautiful thing about the hospital for me is it gives me this incredible platform to kind of turn people on eating good food, more so than being in some fancy restaurant uh, where I'm kind of catering to a higher echelon. Now I get the full spectrum. We feed, we feed the homeless shelter. We, we're doing all these neat things in this community, and it feels good. When you and I first met in 2018, um, my colleague, Dr. Arthi Chandra, and myself were out talking with Mike Glenn and the other directors mm-hmm. of Jefferson Healthcare about how to better incorporate actually functional medicine into their healthcare program. I think I tried to have you trapped in a corner so I could ask you more about what you were doing. And you were said, well, you just looked at me and said, well, I've got the sixth graders down at the salmon stream and we're watching salmon run and we're going to fish him. We're going to catch him. We're going to talk about him and we're going to cook him and we're going to eat him. So I got to go. So that is a program that we do with the, the North Limbic Salmon Coalition. We take all the seventh graders from Chimicum and Quilcine and then Port Townsend schools and they meet up at the Illahee Preserve and they watch the salmon running up the creek. And so it's just like they're wearing their muck boots and walk down to the creek and they actually see a big salmon. I mean, a whopper salmon in this uh-huh. of water. And then they walk up and there I've got this salmon laid out. And I, I show them how I butcher the salmon to skin uh-huh. salmon and how I cook salmon. Just hey, this is how you pan sear a piece of salmon. I ask the questions, is there anybody allergic to salmon? Nobody. Is there anybody that's that loves salmon? And, you know, a few of them, anybody never had salmon and most of them raise their hand. I'm like, well, here's your opportunity. And so we kind of turn kids on to salmon, just make it taste really good, you know, mm-hmm. you know, make a beurre blanc or something with it and serve <laughs> it up with it. And they're like, wow, that was really good. Uh, but it's all out of, you know, the hospital has been really great. In fact, I've got a, a kind of like a mobile kitchen set up that I set up underneath the tent. And I, I can do that. I can go out into the middle of the woods and teach kids how to cook salmon. I've got that. In fact, the, oh man, I can't stand to see uh, waste. I can't stand to see good stainless steel get wasted. So when I first started at the hospital, there's a gurney uh, sitting kind of in the crap yard at the hospital. And I asked, can I have that gurney? And they're like, what are you going to do with a gurney? And the thing that I realized about a, a patient gurney is that it rolls. It's a table, more or less, that rolls around. But yeah. if you lock those wheels, it becomes this amazing platform. So I took um, an old gurney and I took it into my shop and manipulated it into a cooking gurney, a propane burner and uh, a nice cutting surface. And I had my mobile hand washing station. And the looks I got when I pulled that up to the farmer's market it's kind of a good metaphor. It's like, I'm teaching you stuff that's going to kind of keep you off this thing. It's kind of morbid. I don't know. But I was just like, oh, that's such a good piece of equipment. I can't stand to see it go into the rubbish heap. Yeah. So what, we've done things like that. Uh, we have uh, Cape Clear Salmon, uh, is who we mm-hmm. our salmon from. And the minute that I saw Rick Oltman's salmon cart, I said, I have to have one of those. I think within three months of that, I had welded up this big cart that was my, uh, I did the farmer's market for about two years with my cart that I pulled behind my little truck and would do local beef burgers at the farmer's market. And that was cool, man. Um, So the whole idea of mobile kitchens is pretty neat. But these are different. These aren't like a trailer that you walk into. These are a trailer that you kind of walk around. And it's an interesting way to cook. It's a a beautiful thing. So yeah, that was kind of like the first iteration of that. And then I've gone on to do other things outdoor cooking wise. So it's pretty neat. Just thinking back, because I'm now I'm a little obsessed with your community hub kitchen, community kitchen idea. Because Mm. if you had you know, outside a series of trucks, then you could bring whatever was made locally to different parts of the community in order to... I I look at our local food bank, um, which we've got a vibrant food bank. Shirley Moss does the food bank here locally in town and it is, she does a great job. But I look at, so if you look at a food bank, and most of the recipients of food banks, some some of the food bank recipients don't have pots and pans. They don't have a stove or an oven. And so the whole idea of, of having these beautiful organic dried beans, you know, donated yeah. by the co-op to the food bank, but everybody's afraid of them. So you have to have a, a class on how to do it. And then the whole idea of having almost like an equipment 
you know, a, a bin of odds and ends equipment, pots and pans that people are uh, tired of. So you can give them the the tools to use to cook it. But then I think about the community kitchen ideas, like you could be teaching people to cook, manipulating beans to serve people at the food bank. It makes sense to me. It's just a, a beautiful symbiosis circle the way it should be done. At one point when you and I were chatting, um, and I was saying, what do you think one of the obstacles would be to kind of running kind of what you do somewhere else? And you were saying that you've got such a great food hub, such a great natural, easy food hub in Port Townsend. In a city like, you know, if you tried this in Denver or in, you know, San Jose or in, you know, Omaha, you need, and I don't know those cities very well. So those are just picked randomly. But like the idea of what would be the natural food hub, you would need to start having a food hub so that people can get connected, both producers and processors and eaters. It's part of the whole picture, encouraging people to farm. We see young farmers, you know, that are, you know, getting out of college and and deciding instead of becoming a bank or a lawyer, they want to become a farmer, but it's a hard go. So this whole idea of encouraging young farmers And we thought about the whole idea of like, boy, what if there was a big piece of land that had a little, you know, big piece of land, like you could subdivide it into smaller plots of land and give a person a little place to live and to grow some food. And that's how you start teaching farmers because that's that's a dying trade too. I mean, it goes more to that monocrop story uh, and less of the diversity of a small farm. And if we can start that and then have a place to manipulate the food and teach people to cook, I mean, and food hubs are a big thing. Farmers want to be able to know if they plan it, that there is going to be a market for it. Even if it's on, I mean, I get calls, hey, I've got, you know, a flat of strawberries. Can you use them? Yeah, bring them to me. We'll figure out some, even if we just freeze them, we're still figuring out a use for them that we'll figure something to do later on with them. But I feel it. I, you know, I'm from Atlanta where, you know, in the early 90s, organic produce in Atlanta was non-existent. I mean, it was really heard about it. It wasn't until I really hit Boston that organics really started to be something in my life. And sort of when I met my wife, it really was like, oh, organics, the thing to be. (laughs) It's kind of funny because if you go back, well, old McDonald was organic and our grandparents were organic. It's kind of reverting back to those old times as far as agriculture is concerned and about how much time, you know, when I I do my chicken demo where I take a a chicken, I don't slaughter a chicken. I just butcher a chicken down and show people how to do different things with chicken. But it's the how many people know how to butcher a chicken and some people, how many people know how to slaughter a chicken. If you look back 50, 60 years ago, in order to eat a chicken, you had to know how to slaughter and butcher a chicken. Do you think the waste of food when you're raising and butchering and slaughtering yourself was nil? I mean, you didn't waste a thing. And some of my earliest culinary experiences were from uh, most of my chefs were my first chef, Wolfgang Grot, was post-war Germany, and he didn't waste a thing. Everything had a second life. It wasn't even called leftovers. It was like, what are we going to do with this? So we're constantly manipulating things that we had already served. And he always used to say, um, one man's soup is another man's sauce, you know, kind of thing. So I still say the most exciting time to cook is the last day of the ski trip open the refrigerator and see what we can use up, the pasta and and, uh, pancake batter. It's exciting cooking. I totally agree. We have too many options so that our minds end up thinking about parsing it out as opposed to, you know, when it's just kale and when that's Mm -hmm. what's grown. And then you get the exciting part of being creative with it. Too many, when you're faced with a thousand options or, you know, a hundred restaurants to pick from to eat at or a hundred, you know, it's too much. There's actually, there's a great article. There's a research article and it's like, a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. Mind. I think we actually do well when we have some limitations and then we get mm-hmm. to be creative within those realistic limitations. So this we don't necessarily what... need produce from all seven continents no. to be able to pick from for a meal. We need what's meant for our bodies in this time and place. Again, if you go back in time to like the innkeeper in old day France, you know, the, the farmer pulled up in his carriage and pulled back the tarp and said, this is what you have. That's the cooking that I kind of like to do. It's like, you have this, how are we going to make this taste good? And that's where you're relying on skilled culinarians. In this day and age, we write menus based on canned goods, you know, tomatoes in the middle of winter is what you find on menus. 
And I always thought, wow, that's pretty weird because tomatoes aren't even seasoned, you know, but winter squash, now you can do something with that, you know? Yeah. So it was kind and of I fun. remember seeing a class you're teaching recently, like something to do with a chicken, all the, just as you were saying, all those parts of the chicken, how to make a chicken last, how to break down. A- I've always believed in methods. Part of any culinarian's education is your gleaning skills and essentially your journeyman. You're gleaning all these skills. And then when you get, you know, 15 years into the trade, you've kind of figured out what's the best method that works for you for several different reasons. And so instead of showing somebody a specific recipe, and I always bring uh, Julia Childs into this. So I cooked in Boston and I had the opportunity to, to meet Julia on several occasions in Boston and watch Julia Childs cooking show. And she's, she's showing you how to do a recipe. But when it comes to recipe cooking, you're kind of cooking with blinders on. It's a uh, follow the recipe to a T. And I would say, oh, I this amount of salt exactly at this moment. You've got it perfect. <laughs> If your method's cooking and you've got ingredient, then you're using your own devices. Then it's, it becomes a very sensual way to cook. You're using, how do I put this? The best way I can explain it is when you eat fajitas at a Mexican restaurant. The mm-hmm. first sense that comes off, you hear the door flap open and you kind of hear a sizzle coming your way and it's ears. Then as it gets closer, you can see it. Oh, I see that shrimp and those peppers and that onion. And so the visual happens. Then as it gets closer to you, you're kind of like, oh, I can smell it now. And then they put it down on the table, put the tortilla, and then it touches your lips. So you're touching it a split second before you're tasting it. And then all the alarms go off. So if art exists to appease the senses, like a painting, appeases the visual, then if art exists to appease the senses, that of cuisine must be the truest form because it's, it's, a, it's a sensual experience. And I kind of got this, it was sort of funny. I landed a job as a sous chef in Boston at the Museum of Fine Art. And that meant that I had this tag around my neck that I could just go wander the museum anytime I wanted to. And most of the dishwashers and prep cooks that I had were art students at the Gardner Museum. And so having these great conversations about art and the conversation that really helped forge that idea that what the art form that I practice being a culinary artist is invokes all the senses and it's instant gratification. You know, when you put a plate out and someone eats it and they put a smile on their face, it is like, I don't have to cut off my ear. It's pretty neat uh, in that regard. And I think that there are ways, we were just talking about this. I was talking about this with um, Dr. Eileen Ruhoy, the neurologist in our office yesterday, dear friend. And we were just talking about what brings us joy is really to be connected to, mm-hmm. to be able to experience with our senses and to feel connected to one another. So when we look at the things that disconnect us, the things that we think are going to make us happy is now we've all surrendered this ability to be connected to our food and connected to our cooking. And now we go to work and we work in our boxes, like in our cubicles and our offices and our, on our phones, on our computers. And then we get fast food. And then um, we had another guest on the show um, a number of weeks ago, Dr. Steven Bezruchka, who's in population health at University of Washington. And his whole story, one of the things we talked about was how when we used to barter and trade, as you're saying, all about the relationship so that sure. as you're bartering and trading for an item, it's also about the connection with the person who's doing the selling. And sure. especially here in COVID-19, you know, we're shopping online, we're shopping on the internet. And so our connection for acquiring of material things even has been broken further and further and further. And so now, you know, we were trained by our economic system to be consumers and to have things mm-hmm. drop into our lap and to not care about producing our food or not care about, you know, just we all we want is the hot sizzling plate that's mm-hmm. served to us in a four star restaurant. But all of the connection before that is what really brings us joy as humans. Like sure. the, evolutionarily speaking, that's where we really garner our joy from. So if we really want to, even in this time of COVID, when we're trying to be less connected, if we can start with gardens, if we can start with thinking about where our food comes from, if we can start thinking about, I love um, method cooking. I think that's what I've always done, even though I did not know that. I used to try to follow recipes and it never Mm -hmm. went well. I use recipes as a guide and that's about it. 
I gave all of my cookbooks, a lion's share of my cookbooks to the local high school culinary program. Because now you go online and look up four different recipes for the same thing, kind of come up with your own feel about yes. what it would be like. Yeah. You know, my father taught machine tool and die. It was a teacher, a machine tool and die, and is a tradesman. And it's funny because the machine tool and die that he would do, it was hands-on not CNC so much. And the idea of that hands-on machine tool and die is now a, it's almost like a folk art in a way. And I think that society these days, we lack things certainly here in the United States, making things that are tangible. Like we do computer things that are ethereal, but what are we making on a daily basis? And for the most part, we all have the place, the workshop to make food. Uh, We have refrigerators and, and knives and pots and pans and stoves. We can buy raw product and manipulate it any way we want. For the most part, it's all edible. So it's all a big fat experiment every time you cook. It should be. You know, the whole idea about great grandma's sweet potato casserole is the fact that she wrote it down one day. And we hold that and say, oh, this is the way that great grandma used to do it. But I don't like marshmallows on my sweet potatoes. It's pretty amazing. And I love the idea too, that this is a skill, you know? So somehow I think, you know, in my 45 years that I've been eating all these years, like every day, like there's probably been very few days I've gone in my entire life in the last 365 times 45 that I've ever not eaten, I, that that should somehow make me an expert in how to prepare the food that I've eaten. That's not actually true. It's something that, you know, it's like a, you see it when people go camping, that then they're like, oh, there's no fast food. I have to cook for myself. And yes. they're in a different mind space. So it's fun to cook while you're camping. And yes. that tastes so good because you're out in the elements, but you can have that same experience every day. You know, there's difference between commercial cooking on several different levels cooking for the masses, cooking fine dining. One of my favorite things when I had my kitchen, I would do seven course for 12 people. And that was so fun. I'd sit 12 people down at a table and make them a, over the course of two and a half hours, a seven course meal. They'd be watching me cook while I'm doing this. And so there was no, hey, you're taking too long because they can watch you, you know, always. But that was kind of fun. And then they jump in and want to help and you'd let them help. And it it was just a beautiful experience. And by the end of the day, they're giving you uh, money and saying thank you. And and wow, (laughs) you know, I say for most of my career, I've I've been in, in these different levels of cooking to like really fine dining cooking to, you know, different levels at the museum was like the cafeteria and then the cafe and then the fine dining restaurant is all these levels of food and inspiring cooks in different ways to prepare food. But in the end, it's like the way I inspire is like, you're a culinarian, you know, that's something. Your skill, your trade set is cooking for other people. So you're tasting for other people. And to be able to put those nuances on food that put a smile on someone's face or it's just magical. It really is. One resource I just wanted to, do you know FarmLink, the FarmLink project? I haven't. No, I haven't seen the FarmLink. FarmLink was started with the, by a couple Stanford students during the COVID-19 pandemic because what we're finding is that all these growers who grow these immense amounts of like, you know, tens of thousands of potatoes are mm-hmm. just burying them to compost, yeah. you know, because restaurants are closed and so they're not buying. And so they actually don't have a way to get their food to people. And then on the flip side, we have all these people who are losing their jobs and can't afford to buy food. So we have people <laughs> burying food and we have people, you know, children and pregnant women and older people and just like sure. healthy adult men who are hungry. And it seems untenable to me. So I guess these couple Stanford students call it, started the farmlinkproject.org to basically connect so that farmers have a source and that people who need food have a source where everything can get connected. I say this a lot on the show and kind of in my practice, but Ayurveda, you know, my practice is I started out learning Ayurveda, the traditional medical system of India over 20 years Mm -hmm. ago. And in Ayurveda, food is supposed to turn into tissue, heat, immunity, and consciousness. So you really want to eat for the consciousness that you seek. And so everything you're talking about is really rooting consciousness (laughs) in something that's beautiful. I like that. (laughs) Yeah. So to connect that full circle is really you're looking to the natural world, to the streams where the salmon are running, to Mm -hmm. the grounds where the chart is growing, to where the chickens are running free. All of those elements have 
the level of consciousness that we see because it's part of the natural rhythm of things. And we belong, we forget as people in our daily job and our daily, you know, get up and live like a robot. We forget that we belong in the nature of things. And so just to mention one other element of this as we're kind of winding down a little bit is that all of these things that we're growing in terms of plants, start with seeds. Yes. And so the magic of seeds, I think we don't talk nearly enough in our culture about the tragedy of what's happening with seeds and the crisis we are in with seeds. Most conscious farmers actually save their own seed. They actually grow out, part of their crop is designated for saving the seed. And that's a strong, with here in this community, with most of my farmer friends save seed. Uh, Nash Huber, a lot of A lot of the farmers locally have seed contracts with seed companies, organic seed companies. So they're actually growing seed to be organic seed for produce that sell in little packets. And I feel like the more the smaller seed companies get get bought up by bigger seed companies and it becomes a bottom line thing, then we're kind of losing that that beauty of the heritage varieties and seeds from that and keeping that going. We've got a corn trial, a bean trial, and a squash trial going wow. on our little farm, which is pretty exciting that, wow, we've got all these, we're planting out varieties to save the seed on. But if you think about commodities of the past, seed was super important. The whole network of Grange, the Grange was that farmers could connect and share resources. And one of those resources was seed. And I'm really proud of the local farming community to take uh, such a stand on keeping their own seed lines happening. It's really important stuff. And your wife works with, she works with the Organic Seed Alliance. Yes, Organic Seed Alliance based out of Port Townsend. And uh, she's been doing that, well, uh, since 2006. And just great work, great organization, great work. They work to find varieties that work in different areas, different climate zones for breeding. And and it's all around the United States. Uh, Farmers are breeding for seed or vegetables that actually do well in a specific area. That's what it's all about. We have, um, you plant a dozen different varieties of carrots and see which one does the best. And does it uh-huh. good? And oh, well, this is the, the variety for us, you know. But of course, she can speak to that better than I can. Uh, but I've learned so much from my wife about that. And it's kind of that bond that we have. I think we talked about having a farm on our first date. And here we are. And the one last question I wanted to ask you about is, does the hospital compost? Like, does- Oh, we do. So we work with a, a local farmer, Steve Habesetzer, has Oats Planter Farm that does, he, he has his own uh, seed business, Oats Planter Farm. And we have our green bins and farmer Steve comes and picks up the uh, green bins once a week and he hand turns with a shovel compost from the hospital. So that works out really well for us at the hospital, just uh, saves. And of course, if you have a, a robust composting operation and uh, recycling see less on the garbage side of things. So it's pretty cool. Other things we've done at the hospital, we have a a CSA pickup point. We started uh, two years ago. Um, We have a community supported agriculture pickup point for a community members to pick up their CSA boxes and trying to get off the ground. So I like in-person cooking demos and we're working on a project called Veggie Vignettes, which we would do, you know, less than five minute uh, videos on how to manipulate vegetables that you would locally find in CSA boxes. Because the amount of times I have people call me on the phone and say, I've got this big thing, they call it celery act. What do I do with it? You know, and it's just like, well, I could tell you on the phone, but it'd be much better if you could just watch a two minute video on how to manipulate it. And it's all based on methods. So we're gonna work on that project, uh, the veggie vignette project. I'm just excited about going into this realm of doing cooking demos online. It's going to be a lot of fun. I think it's, it's uh, I'm destined to do it. For those folks listening who don't know what a community supported agriculture or CSA is, I've been a longtime lover of CSAs for the system and for the benefits for all. It's one of those like win, 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 win. Like there's no <laughs> losses to CSAs. The idea is that you as a consumer buy a share from a farm and then the farm grows for you for and gives you a certain amount of vegetables. You can usually buy by like a five pound box or a 10 pound box or a box that feeds three or a box that feeds six or there's fruit CSAs or there's pickle CSAs now and dairy CSAs and grain CSAs. But the idea is that you get your 
produce and that you and the farmer are in it together. So you purchase your share at the beginning of the year. And if there's a huge flood and the farmer loses, then you lose also. So you gain or lose together, which I think is a great way to think of ourselves is tied to the land because that's typically what would happen and that's important interesting with us we're connected to the mainland by a bridge and sometimes that bridge is out and then it, we, we all kind of like oh how do we <laughs> up and oh we get to cook local food you know it's, it's kind of a neat thing it's a magical idea that farmers and culinarians can work together to help feed communities it's just a yeah. it's a no to me And I hope, I know that there's more and more happening in inner cities, but certainly, you know, that would be the dream is to have this pervade through, you know, less agrarian communities and more urban communities so that everyone can gain benefit. And just uh, turning inner city urban kids on to the whole idea of what a farm is, something phenomenal too. Uh, It's amazing. My memories of growing up in Cleveland, you know, I was a very urban kid, well, urban suburban, but we went out to a farm once a year where they had a cow that had a window in its stomach and you could you were <laughs> be able to look inside to see that cow. But it was so dark in there. You couldn't see anything. And it was kind of gross. Yeah. It was very weird. The, the whole idea of taking kids out and, and being on a farm just to feel it's almost like camping. Let's yeah. go pick some tomatoes and bring them into the kitchen and make dinner. And that's a pretty cool experience. Chef Aaron, thank you so, so much for being here. Again, we're with Chef Aaron Stark, who is the food service director at the Jefferson Healthcare Hospital, which serves all of Jefferson County. And it's the northeastern corner of the Olympic Peninsula. So if you look at a map of the United States, if you don't know where this is, and you look all the way, it's upper left corner of Washington State. So and you're on that northeastern peninsula there, Quimper Peninsula. So thank you again for joining us. Um, We are so grateful to have all of your insight. And if, you know, hopefully some of us will be lucky enough to taste some of your recipes. And all of us at some point will be lucky enough to watch your vegetable vignette videos on how to cook. (laughs) Thanks, Julie. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening today with Chef Aaron Stark. We've got lots of ways to continue this conversation through Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can get more information about us on our website, centerforhealingneurology.com. Chef Aaron Stark doesn't actually have a website at this point. He's just a guy doing amazing things in the world. So we await more information from you. Um, Please be sure to share this show with your friends. We welcome your rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. And feel free to send topic requests to podcast at centerforhealingneurology.com. We love that you've joined us today to discuss how to make our whole world medicine. We rise or fall together, and we're committed to doing what we can to make as many of us as healthy as possible. And this takes all of us, including you. Thank you for listening, and see you next time. Party Fish Media acknowledges that it operates and records on indigenous Duwamish and Puget Sound Coast Salish land that is still home to the Duwamish tribe. This land is stolen in violation of the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. We are committed to uplifting the name of these lands and community members from these nations who reside alongside us. For more information on this land, its people, or ways you can help, visit duwamishtribe.org or realrentduwamish.org.